There are lots of Premier League players who have exceeded all expectations this season. Martin Erdegaard has gone from being a neat and tidy number 10 into a routine match winner and one of the league's best ever goal-scoring midfielders. Marcus Rashford has bounced back from the most underwhelming season of his career to date to become one of the most potent attacking threats in the division. And there are about eight players at Brighton who no one had heard of 12 months ago that are now worth over 80 million quid. Not every team or player can outperform expectations though, and in today's video, because I am a cruel and mean-spirited individual, we're going to take a look at one player from each club who stands out as having done just that this season. Blimey, that was a short introduction for me, wasn't it? I will point out that this is just my opinion, which means, of course, that it is absolutely 100% incontestably true. Even if you have followed your team home and away this season, if you disagree with my selection, that just means that you weren't paying enough attention. Right, here is, definitively, every Premier League team's biggest flop this season. Arsenal. Albert Sambi Laconga. It is admittedly unfortunate that my comedic faux arrogance about this list being incontestable is followed immediately by quite possibly the most contestable inclusion of all. Arsenal have had a fantastic season, or at least the first 80% of it was fantastic, and despite a late wobble which has allowed Manchester City to seemingly quite comfortably become Premier League champions, the vast majority of their players have outperformed expectations this season. The exceptions, I would suggest, and to varying degrees, have been Sambi Laconga, Fabio Vieira, Kieran Tierney, Takahiro Tomiyasu, and Emil Smith-Rowe. Tierney is unfortunate that Arsenal signs Zinchenko, who is always going to start ahead of him, though I do think that he has fallen well short of expectations for someone so capable in his 1,421 minutes of football this season. Tomiyasu failed to meet the standards that he set last season before undergoing knee surgery this season. And ML Smith-Rowe has scored no goals and has made just one assist this season, but survives by virtue of the fact that he has been injured throughout the vast majority of it. To be honest, I wanted to pick Fabio Vieira, who set Arsenal back a potential £35 million when he arrived from Porto last summer, but has looked fairly anonymous in his debut campaign. That can happen though, and Vieira is still only 22, so an Arsenal supporting friend of mine convinced me to pick Albert Sambi Laconga instead. Laconga is only a year older than Vieira, and he cost Arsenal almost half as much, but this was his second season at the Emirates, having made an impression over 24 games last season. He did absolutely nothing in his first 15 games of this season though, prompting Arsenal to send him on loan to Crystal Palace and replace him mid-season, where he also hasn't been very good, and that is just about enough for him to sneak in ahead of Vieira. Aston Villa Leon Bailey If I was including managers in this list, my choice for Aston Villa would undoubtedly be Steven Gerrard, without whom Villa might have been in top 4 contention this season. I'm not though, which meant that it was a toss-up between Leon Bailey, Philippe Coutinho, and Robin Olsen. Olsen has been the least impressive of the three, but also probably had the least expectation. Meanwhile, Coutinho's contribution has been bitterly disappointing for a man of his many talents. The highest paid player at Villa Park, and still the third most expensive footballer in the entire history of the sport, Coutinho has scored one goal and made no assists in 22 appearances this season, and has been sidelined for injury since late February. Nonetheless, I've gone with Leon Bailey, who there was so much excitement about coming into this season off the back of an outstanding pre-season campaign. This is poor timing in some respects, given that Bailey made an assist and had one of his best games in a Villa shirt at the weekend, but overall this season, he has been much too quiet. That was only his second assist in his last 13 games, and he hasn't scored a single goal during that time. There is still a player in there, but we haven't seen it anywhere near enough at Villa, and depending upon who Unai Emery brings in this summer, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see Bailey depart. Bournemouth. Ryan Fredericks. It has been a roller coaster of a campaign for Bournemouth, 
who began the season with Scott Parker trying to get himself sacked after a 9-0 defeat to Liverpool by criticising the club's owners and claiming that the squad wasn't good enough to stay up. Written off by Christmas and still the favourites to go down, we ought not forget, as recently as the beginning of March, Gary O'Neill has orchestrated a magnificent turnaround at Dean Court, with the Cherries now sitting pretty in 14th and guaranteed of their Premier League status next season. Most of their squad have outperformed expectations then, but there are always some exceptions. Junior Stanislas has struggled for minutes, with form, and particularly with injuries. Mark Travers has failed to replicate the impressive form that he showed in the championship, now firmly playing second fiddle behind Neto. And though it is early days, Antoine Semenyo has failed to hit the ground running since his £10 million January arrival from Bristol City. The most underwhelming of the lot, though, has been right-back Ryan Fredericks, whose season has run directly contrary to Bournemouth's as a whole in many respects. He actually made quite a bright start to the campaign following his arrival from West Ham, with some positive October performances, but it has been all downhill from there. Since recovering from injury in February, Fredericks has made just four deeply unimpressive cameo appearances, and he hasn't even made the Cherry squad since March during their late season revival. Brentford. Mikel Damsgaard. Brentford don't get much wrong, especially not within the transfer market, and are basically synonymous with punching above their weight at this stage. But it is their two most expensive signings that have underwhelmed most this season. Club record signing Keen Lewis Potter has played barely 500 minutes of football this season, having suffered repeated injury setbacks, but it's Mikel Damsgaard's form that will perhaps be of even greater concern. Signed from Sampdoria for a fee of 15 million euros over the summer, you may recall that Damsgaard scored a stunning free kick for Denmark against England in the semi-finals of Euro 2020. Brentford's Danish ties run deep, and they proceeded with their big money move for Damsgaard, despite the fact that he didn't get a single goal or assist all last season, having spent over six months out injured. Despite having remained fit throughout this season though, unlike Keen Lewis Potter, Damsgaard has made very little impact. Much too lightweight and passive, Damsgaard has failed to score or assist in 24 Premier League outings in a relatively free-scoring Brentford side. The Bees' recruitment is such, combined with Damsgaard's young age, that you wouldn't rule out him coming good next season. But for this season, I'm afraid he simply has to feature. Brighton and Hove Albion. Dennis Sundav. Probably the toughest decision in this entire video, Brighton have been outstanding this season, most of their players have handsomely enhanced their reputations, and even Dennis Sundav has found form over the last couple of weeks. The German-born forward, who is of Kurdish descent, has scored three goals in his last four games, including a sumptuous lob in only an eight-minute cameo appearance against Arsenal. There are positive signs, therefore, and the fact that Brighton signed him means that he will inevitably, at some stage, be worth at least £50 million. With that being said, prior to scoring a brace against Wolves late last month, Undav had done next to nothing this season. In 14 Premier League appearances, he had failed to score or assist a single goal. That is a pretty miserable record, especially when, unlike with a lot of unknown Brighton signings, expectations for Undav were actually pretty high. Last season, while starring for Brighton's satellite club, Union saint gilois Undav scored an incredible 25 goals and made 10 assists in only 33 Belgian Pro League appearances. Out of the available options then, he simply has to feature. Chelsea. Raheem Sterling. If we are being totally honest here, there isn't a single member of the Chelsea squad that could complain if they featured in this video, and most would probably be more deserving inclusions than the representatives from a majority of other clubs. Perhaps Rhys James, on the rare occasions in which he is actually fit, hasn't been that bad, and Thiago Silva probably the best of the rest, but outside of those two, it has been a real dumpster fire. Put it this way, if administrators were eligible, Todd Bowley would be in big trouble. They're not though, and since I have to narrow it down to just one player, I think that the leading candidates are Raheem Sterling, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, Mikhailo Mudrik, Mark Kukurea, 
Kai Havertz, and Kalidou Koulibaly. Aubameyang has been an unmitigated disaster, and it's hard to imagine things going much worse. Mudrick is young, talented, and it's early days, but he arrived for a massive fee and has been fairly anonymous so far. Kukurea's fee was always ridiculous, and so it has proved. I think that the same is true of Kalidou Koulibaly, especially given his age. And Havertz is supremely talented, and I've no doubt that he will succeed at his next club, but he has been really poor this season. Long-term subscribers to this channel will know the high regard that I hold Raheem Sterling in, though. And it is that dissonance between expectations and reality that we're really measuring in this video. Sterling set Chelsea back £47.5 million, a reasonable fee given his age and record at Manchester City, but so far things just haven't worked out at all at Chelsea. He is far from the only one, of course, and he did score twice in Chelsea's recent 2 all draw with Nottingham Forest, but that only takes him up to six goals in the Premier League this season, and nine in all competitions. If he fails to score again, it will be the first time that Sterling has failed to hit double figures in a season since the 2012-13 season, which started when he was 17. Crystal Palace, Jean-Philippe Mateta. It is a choice of two French forwards at Crystal Palace as far as I'm concerned, namely Odson Edouard and Jean-Philippe Mateta. In truth, and I say this despite thinking Edouard was excellent for Celtic and would be a great signing for Palace, I'm not sure that either of them are good enough. Edouard has only scored one goal in more than 20 games since the World Cup break, which took him up to four Premier League goals and two assists for the campaign as a whole, but even that is better than Mateta's miserable tally of two goals and no assists from 30 appearances in all competitions. Signed by Palace on loan in January 2021 for a fee of €3 million, Euros, and then on a permanent basis for a further €15 million Euros the following summer, Mateta offers frighteningly little at times. He makes the right movements, gets himself into the right areas, and has illustrated an ability to score goals outside of the Premier League. In the Premier League, though, he looks utterly hopeless, especially this season, and that's why he features. Everton, Neil Mope, sticking to the theme of useless centre forwards, that is a very mean introduction, I apologise for that, I don't actually think that Neil Mope is useless, but he has certainly looked it at Everton. One of many excellent signings made by Brentford in recent years, Mope scored 28 goals in his second season with the Bees, before joining Brighton for £20 million. Mope could best be described as okay in his three seasons at Brighton, scoring 10, 8, and 9 goals in a Brighton team that was frequently accused of lacking cutting edge. Everton fans can only dream of Mopé rediscovering that lack of cutting edge at Goodison Park though, where Mopé has scored just one goal in 28 games and has failed to register a single Premier League assist. His only goal, which admittedly was an important one against West Ham, came in only his second appearance for the club meaning that Mopé has now gone 26 games on Merseyside without finding the back of the net. Everton paid £15 million for Mopé. They might as well have just set fire to that money and had a big bonfire, or used it to buy a lifetime supply of bubble wrap to try and keep Dominic Calvert-Lewin safe. Mopé is probably the easiest inclusion in this entire video. Fulham. Kevin Mbabu. A man who illustrates just how difficult it is to get recruitment decisions right in football, given Kevin and Barbu's performances for both Young Boys and Wolfsburg, you'd expect him to become a key player at Fulham following his summer arrival. Owner Tony Khan even said that the club had been following and Barbu and trying to sign him for years, but now they will almost certainly be wishing that they hadn't. Despite that extensive scouting, Mbabu played just 140 minutes of football over six games at the beginning of this season, never seeing out 90 minutes, before Marco Silva decided that he'd seen enough. Form, confidence, tactics, and competition were the four reasons that Silva cited for things not working out for Mbabu at Fulham, which is a very nice way of saying that he didn't think he was very good. Mbabu was dropped for Kenny Tete and then shipped out on loan to Servette in Switzerland in January after Fulham signed Cedric. 
A dishonorable mention goes to Carlos Vinicius, signed as backup to Alexander Mitrovic over the summer for £9.5 million, who has only scored five goals in 31 games this season. Leeds United, Elan Melia. Lots of things have gone wrong for Leeds United this season, and indeed last season, as I covered in lots more depth in a recent feature-length video. The likes of Weston McKenney, Brendan Aronson, Jorginho Rutter and Patrick Bamford would all fall into the fairly underwhelming category this season, but none more so than Elan Melier in my view. Melier only turned 23 a couple of months ago, an age at which many goalkeepers are still yet to become their team's number one, yet he has already racked up 173 first-team appearances for Leeds and Laurent, over 100 of them coming in the Premier League. Since Sam Allardyce took over at Ellen Road, though, Melia has been dropped in place of the 32-year-old Joel Robles, and for very good reason. The reason being that he has been rubbish all season, in case that wasn't clear. I don't want to go in studs up on Melia because he is still very young for a keeper, and he's not the only player who has been rubbish at Leeds this season. But it would be fair to say that his stock has fallen faster than a cat that has been pushed out of a six-story window. It's a bit of a weird analogy. Everybody knew exactly what I was talking about. Linked with a £30 million move to Tottenham, Chelsea and Manchester United as recently as March of this year, I would be amazed if Melier was a Premier League number one next season now. Leicester City, Wilfred and Didi. In so many instances in this video, I am slagging off players that I really like, but that's because you can only flop in relation to expectations, and my expectations of Wilfred and Didi are high. To say that he has fallen short of those expectations this season would be a catastrophic understatement, as I'm not sure that there is a single Premier League player who has fallen off more than him this term. Signed by Leicester from Genk for £17 million all the way back in January 2017, and Didi has played almost 250 games for the Foxes, despite the fact that he is still only 26 years old. 12 months ago, you'd have done well to find a top six team who wouldn't have taken him, and Leicester were valuing him at upwards of £60 million. This season, there has been no intensity to his game, his tenacity has seemingly evaporated, and he has forgotten how to tackle. And Didi hasn't made a single tackle in his last three Premier League starts, having only gone one Premier League game without making a tackle over the last five years up to that point. Jamie Vardy, Danny Ward, and Kiernan Dewsbury Hall have all had notably disappointing seasons as well, but none can rival Ndidi. Liverpool. Fabinho. A calamitous season has become merely a poor one for Liverpool, thanks to an outstanding finish, but not everyone's blushes have been spared. Trent Alexander-Arnold has got his act together with a new role towards the back end of the campaign, finally producing some of his best form, but Virgil van Dijk and Joel Gomez have still fallen well short of expectations throughout much of the campaign. The most disappointing of all, though, at least as far as I'm concerned, has been Fabinho. One of the most impressive defence midfielders in Europe for his first four seasons at Anfield, following his £39 million arrival from Monaco, I thought there were worrying signs from Fabinho towards the back end of last season, but nothing that could have prepared us for what was to come. For the first 80-90% to 90 of this season, Fabinho was barely a shadow of his former self, and Liverpool looked incredibly fragile in midfield as a result. Perhaps fearing his future at the club may be numbered, he has, very belatedly, shown glimpses of his former self in recent games. And if he can get back to his best, that will make Liverpool's summer recruitment dilemma somewhat less complicated. For now though, that remains a big if. Manchester City, Calvin Phillips. It's not unusual for players to take a season to settle in at Manchester City, being fairly heavily criticised and not playing much football, before adapting to Pep Guardiola's demands and flourishing the following term. We saw that with Jack Grealish this season, Ilkay Gundogan before him, and with the likes of John Stones and Nathan Ake, who took a little bit longer but have been so formidable this season. For that reason, assuming they don't sell him, and despite Pep calling him unfit at Christmas, which I found 
a little bit odd, I could see Phillips getting a lot more football next season. Nonetheless, as a £42 million signing, rising to £45 million subject to add-ons, who has played just 104 minutes of football in the Premier League this season, there is no way in which he couldn't feature. I suppose a dishonourable mention should go to Joao Cancelo, who was perhaps the best fullback on the planet last season, but was ditched by Pep in January quite spectacularly, even if that was predominantly for non-football reasons. Manchester United, Jadon Sancho. It has been a remarkable season for Manchester United, and I don't necessarily mean remarkably good or bad, just remarkable. It's hard to believe that their 4-0 defeat to Brentford, 6-3 defeat to Manchester City, 7-0 defeat to Liverpool, EFL Cup win, Barcelona win, Sevilla defeat, and Cristiano Ronaldo melodrama were all this season, with an FA Cup final still to come. Come to think of it, Cristiano Ronaldo could quite easily have been my inclusion for the Red Devils, but I'll stick to a player that is still at the club. Harry Maguire, Anthony, Wout Weghorst and Anthony Martial would all poll reasonably well, one suspects, if you were to ask a representative sample of Manchester United fans who their most underwhelming player has been this season. But I think expectations for Maguire had already been lowered. It's Anthony's debut campaign, Veghorst had already struggled at Burnley, and we should know by now much better than to expect much of Anthony Martial. You could say the same, I suppose, about Jadon Sancho following his debut campaign last season, but I still think that he is a sensational footballer, and I can't quite believe how little we have seen of it this season. The £73 million man scored 20 goals and made 20 assists in 44 games for Borussia Dortmund in the 2019-20 season. This season, he has scored 6 goals and made 2 assists in 37 games. Sancho is still only 23, but clearly something's just not quite right with him at Old Trafford. And perhaps a separation is inevitable, and the best course of action for both parties at this stage. Newcastle United, Anthony Gordon. I'll get pelters for this one in the comments from Newcastle United fans, so before they say it, yes, he is young, yes, he's only been at the club six months, well, not even that, I suppose, more like four. And yes, it is quite possible that he will come good next season. The main reason that Gordon features is simply because Newcastle have been so good this season, vastly outperforming expectations, and I don't think that there has been an obvious flop at the club. You could argue Ryan Fraser, I suppose, who has been forced to train with the reserves by his old Bournemouth boss, Eddie Howe, which isn't ideal, but were there really any great expectations of him coming into the campaign? Ultimately, Gordon cost Newcastle between 40 to 45 million pounds, and whilst that's the kind of cash that their owners would drop without a second's hesitation on bombs manufactured by British arms companies and used to kill Yemeni children, in the context of Premier League football, it is a hefty fee. And it means that Gordon's performances will be scrutinised from the outside more so than Matt Ritchie or Dan Burns, for example. As of yet, he has done very little, and whilst I acknowledge that could well change, that isn't the criteria, and through a lack of alternatives, he has to feature. Nottingham Forest, Jesse Lingard. There have been several flops at Nottingham Forest this season, which is sort of inevitable when you drop £200 million on a brand new squad of players, but none more notable than Jesse Lingard. Lingard's often misrepresented, but still nonetheless enormous wages at Forest were very widely reported over the summer, but there was every reason to believe that he could justify them. After all, Lingard had no transfer fee, and in half a season at West Ham, he scored nine goals and made six assists in only 16 Premier League matches. This season, however, Lingard has contributed about as much to Forest survival hopes as Bear Grylls. In 17 Premier League outings, Lingard has popped up with a sensational zero goals and zero assists, but he did clap the Manchester United fans, which was awfully nice of him. Dishonourable mentions go to John Joe Shelby, Remo Freuler, Emmanuel Dennis, and somewhat harshly, perhaps, Chris Wood, though he only made seven appearances before being sidelined for the rest of the campaign with a thigh injury. 
Southampton, Mizla Vorsic. One of the Premier League's strangest signings this season, Southampton completed a £6 to £8 million deal for Mislav Orsic in January, whilst they were already firmly embroiled in a relegation scrap. Age 30, Orsic wasn't one for the future then, but someone who was hoped could make an instant impact. Orsic had been sensational for Dinamo Zagreb over the past three and a half years, and already had 21 goal contributions from 28 appearances in the first half of this season. Four months on, Dinamo Zagreb are already said to be in talks to re-sign Orsic, with the Saints desperately trying to claw back as much of that cash as possible. Orsic has made one six-minute cameo appearance in the Premier League since his arrival. Yes, that's right one six-minute appearance, which is pretty extraordinary when one thinks that it's not exactly as though Southampton's starters have been doing a stellar job. Orsic apparently feels as though he has been disrespected at Southampton, and one just hopes that he didn't bother buying a house there, especially not with the state of interest rates at the moment. Dishonorable mentions go to Adam Armstrong, Seiku Mara, and Paul Onowachu, and Southampton certainly appear to have something of a rebuild on their hands, ahead of life back in the championship. Tottenham Hotspur, Rich Arlison. Alright, I take back everything that I said about Wilfred and Didi and Neil Mope. The easiest inclusion in this video, and the player whose stock has fallen furthest, is surely Rich Arlison who was signed by Spurs for a potential £60 million in the summer, has scored just one Premier League goal all season, and midway through the campaign, after he said that it had been a rubbish season, Antonio Conte clarified that statement by saying that, yes, Richarlison had been very bad this season, and neither of them actually used the word bad. I quite like Richarlison, and unlike some, I don't think that he is a massive fraud who is rubbish at football, but he has certainly been rubbish this season. Hugo Lloris and Hyungmin Son are fortunate not to feature. West Ham, Gianluca Scamacca. With a faint whiff of Sebastian Allaire about him, you wouldn't be all that surprised if after leaving West Ham, Gianluca Scamacca went on to find success elsewhere on the continent. Signed by the Hammers last summer for a fee of more than £30 million, rising to £35.5 million subject to add-ons, Skamaka certainly didn't come cheap. That's because he scored 16 goals for Sassuolo last season, where he was outscored by only 5 players in Serie A, at the age of only 23 no less. With his size, strength, and aerial prowess, Skamaka seemed to fit the profile of forward that David Moyes wanted down to a T, but it hasn't worked out like that just yet. Knee injuries have ruled Skamaka out for three months of the campaign, including all of the last two months, but even when fit, he has only managed to score three goals in 16 Premier League matches to date. It's not unusual for forwards to take a season to settle in to a new league language and set of surroundings, but for now, Skamaka has to feature just ahead of Thomas Suchek, who has also been bitterly disappointing this season. Tilo Keira, just in case you were wondering, misses out because I have never rated him, and if anything, he's probably been slightly better than I expected while still being quite bad. Wolves. Gonzalo Guedes. It has been a broadly underwhelming season for Wolves, who have regressed from last season, but have improved significantly since Julian Lopetegui's November arrival. There are lots of Wolves players who have been pretty unimpressive this season, from Raul Jimenez, who hasn't scored a single Premier League goal, to the likes of Johnny and Pablo Sarabia, both of whom I rate highly as players but have been disappointing, especially Sarabia, who I thought was a great signing in January. Anyway, they all get off scot-free because of Gonzalo Guedes, who cost Wolves a fortune and was terrible before being allowed to join Benfica on loan. A Portuguese international capped 32 times at the age of 26, Guedes took some convincing to join Wolves last summer, and now they'll be wishing that their powers of persuasion and contract offer hadn't been quite so strong. Guedes made just 13 Premier League appearances for Wolves, scoring one goal and making one assist, failing to settle in Wolverhampton, both on and off the pitch. His record at Benfica, where he has struggled with injuries, hasn't been any more impressive, 
and Wolves will face an uphill challenge this summer to recoup as much of their near £30 million outlay on Gerdes as is physically possible. The lesson, as far as some Wolves fans are concerned, is only sign players who want to play for the club, rather than going to extensive lengths to convince those who don't, which seems especially apt given recent stories surrounding the club's pursuit of Anzu Fati. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much, as ever, for watching. I hope that you enjoyed it. A bit of a miserable one, I suppose. We'll, uh, we'll try to be more positive with the next video, but hit the like button if you enjoyed it, or agreed with me, or didn't, just want to help with the algorithm. Uh, let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure, of course, that you are subscribed to both this channel and to my second channel, both of which should be on your screens now, or about to appear, along with two videos that you can watch after this one, should you wish to do so. You can also find me on Twitter or on Instagram via the username at HITC7s, should you feel so inclined.